welcome to the weekly live of Colorism Healing with your truly Dr. Sarah Webb. I'm really excited to continue this conversation that we began last week on color and class, our colorism and classism. And before we jump into that, I want to I want you to say hello. Let me know where you're tuning in from, especially if this is your first time joining. And I do have some really special announcements to make. The big one is that the 2021 Colorism Healing Writing Contest and Anthology is going to come out this week and we have a live book launch. Yes, a live book launch going uh, streaming on YouTube this Friday, August 20th at noon central time. So join me and several of the lovely, talented, brave writers who participated this year. You'll get to see their faces if they choose to be on camera. You get to hear them read some of their work and we're going to have a lively discussion about colorism, about how writing can help us express ourselves and we'll do some healing work. And there's going to be a lot of interactive questions with the audience. So you have the opportunity to win a free copy of the book or to win other swag from Colorism Healing um, if you attend live. Now, in the past, they've, they've lasted about two hours. So if you can't sit the whole time, we'd love to see you drop in either at the beginning or if you have to tune in late. Um, so don't think that if you can't be there the whole time that you shouldn't come. Come even if you can only stay for 10 minutes. We'd love to see you say hello and help us celebrate the success of this year's contest. Um, so that's my announcement. <laughs> Let's see who's tuning in. Again, the topic is colorism and classism part two, picking back up with the lively discussion we had last week. Uh, hey, 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 come on in the room. Isn't that a song? Isn't that a gospel song? Come on in the room or something like that. <laughs> Chicago. Hey, Chicago in the house. I'm in Springfield, Illinois, Oakland, California. What's up, Oaktown? Yes, I used to live in Oakland. Uh, I love it. Rainy Atlanta, Georgia and The Running Man. Ah, rainy Atlanta, Georgia. I have some family that live in Atlanta too. So tell them hey for me. <laughs> hey, Lucid Los, Glad to have you this week. Um, Sarah Best Will, how you doing? From Boston, overcast, kind of humid. Okay, so it's sunny and humid in Springfield where I'm at. Um, and I've been enjoying it because like the high is like the low 80s, which is cool. It's like that's basically a cool day for me, right? Like 82, 84, you know, that's a breeze, literally. From Nairobi, Kenya, this is Bella N.O. Nice to meet you from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, that was one of my, my sister studied abroad in Kenya for a while. That was one of her favorite trips, international trips was her trip to Kenya. So, um I haven't gotten out there yet, but maybe this is a sign <laughs> that I need to put that on my itinerary and do some um, traveling in Kenya specifically. All right, so let's jump in to this topic, colorism and classism, part two. So last week, I began by talking about Angela Davis and how a lot of her work inspired me. And she was talking about intersectionality before that term was coined, right? Kimberly Crenshaw coined that term in late 18, 19, 1989. But even before then, Black feminists, Black activists, Black female activists were talking about the need to acknowledge the interlocking systems of race and class and sex in particular, right? And even sexuality. And that, you know, really opened my eyes to the you know ideas like massage and war and how for black women even in black spaces we were second class citizens but i also ended last week's conversation by acknowledging that angela davis um as important as her work is part of the reason we know of her part of the reason why she is so iconic as an activist is because she's lighter skinned she's very fair skinned she has narrow features and a loose curl pattern right and so there's been some acknowledgement some conversation about the role of colorism in the civil rights movement um how women like kathleen cleaver were the ones being interviewed for like public media and things like that because of how they looked 
And then Angela Davis also came from a middle class black family, right? Her parents were college educated and she had opportunities and access to things throughout her childhood that a lot of other black people growing up in America did not have, especially during that time, right? Um, and so I want to kind of start there. And there, there are three questions that I want to ask that I want to really dive into today. And so I'll tell you the three questions and then I'll go back and kind of talk about them one by one. And as always, your comments and your feedback and your additional questions in the live are really important to me. So I'll be reading those along the way. So the three questions, one is how color discrimination impacts your economic status, right? Particularly discrimination in the workforce and how that can limit economic opportunities. And the second one is how color privilege is generational, how that is a form of generational wealth that compounds over time, right? And then the third one is the question, if color is currency, what does it afford us, right? So I want to start with the very real, documented, um, researched, and studied phenomenon of color discrimination. So everyone is familiar with racial discrimination. People know that, you know, a white person with a criminal record is more likely to be employed than a black person without a criminal record, right? These are the kinds of statistics around race that we know. And fewer people, far fewer people are aware that similar inequalities exist on the basis of color. So lighter skinned people, especially, you know, throughout history have been more likely to receive a job, to get hired in the first place. And then when they are hired, when we are on the workforce, they're also more likely to earn higher wages than darker skinned people in, in similar career, career fields. And this, yes, this is despite levels of education. This is despite levels of work experience, right? And one study, you know, indicated that skin tone was more important in terms of the judgment call that interviewers were making than amount of work experience or then level of education, right? And so that bias, subconscious bias is really, really strong. That implicit bias is really strong. And then even looking at the pipeline to the workforce, right? Before you even start to apply for jobs, there's the school piece, the education piece. And there's studies that study after study after study shows that lighter skinned individuals are more likely to complete high school, to complete college, to attend college than darker skinned people. And there was one study done not too long ago that looked at um, Hispanic and Latinx individuals and Asian Americans, and they looked at siblings. So they looked at siblings, people that were born and raised in the same household, same family, right? And so even for siblings, the lighter skinned sibling was more likely to achieve higher levels of education, right? And I emphasize the fact that they did this study on siblings because people often try to say, well, what about, you know, how much the family encouraged education? Or what about the, what if you factor in the level of education that their parents had? And people try to find all kinds of other ways to explain this phenomenon. But I think a study like this, um, you know, suggests or shows us that even when we hold family background constant, it's still the lighter skinned people that are receiving higher education, right? And not obviously I have a PhD. So again, for any of the devil's advocates out there who want to throw out an example of, you know, the opposite of that, it's not that doesn't mean dark skinned people don't get education. It's about the percentages. It's about the, the ratio, right? And the um, what's that the the what's that term like if you're the odds the odds yes it's the odds of that happening if you're lighter skinned versus if you're darker skinned right um and then in terms of color discrimination there's definitely that implicit bias that people have continued to study and do research on where lighter skinned people are more likely to be hired because of the associations of intelligence and professionalism and people unconsciously assume that, oh, well, you're more approachable, or you're more relatable, or you kind of just fit in with our work culture a little bit better, right? And the darker skinned person, like, I don't, I don't know, she's just really hard to work with, you know? And like these kinds of dynamics that happen 
before you get hired and after you get hired, right? And so getting promoted, right? So let's say you do get hired, but are you likely to be promoted to management or to a supervisory role? And if you are, what are the additional hurdles and burdens and um, obstacles that diminish your ability to thrive on that job in the same way that your lighter skin colleagues really can? So all that can happen implicitly, but I have to keep it 100. There are explicit cases of color discrimination, right? Where people explicitly, like consciously say, oh, we don't want any dark skinned people working in the front, right? Because they just don't look right. They don't fit the aesthetic of this establishment. There are people who consciously say, I can't hire black people because they always steal from me. Or I can't hire dark skinned people because they always tend to steal from me, right? And these stereotypes that, again, people have been talking about it in terms of racial stereotypes, but there are even amongst black employers, for example, who stigmatize their darker skin employees are calling them lazy, right? Are they lazy? Are they, they just don't know how to work. Are they don't talk right? Are they don't communicate well enough? And the lighter skin employees, they just work better. So that has been very, very explicit, especially when we talk about historically, right? The historic practice of that. There were like, for example, black owned law firms, black owned um, schools and black owned like businesses that hired very light skinned receptionists on purpose that would not hire a dark skinned woman to check in people at their hotel. And this is like black owned businesses as well. And so all of that like history of employment discrimination has over time throughout generations has limited the economic opportunities for darker skinned people and um, increased or multiplied the economic opportunities for lighter skinned people. And I see a lot of comments coming in. So before I jump into the comments to read those, I also want to talk about the entertainment industry. So I posted last week, was it last week, Saturday, I think, um, I posted about like representation in the media, right? And people say, oh, that's just entertainment. That's just TV. But the entertainment industry is a career field. The entertainment industry is jobs. It is jobs. It is employment. And so I'll say this very clearly because people try to trivialize conversations about colorism in the media. But colorism in casting is colorism in hiring, right? Actors have a job. That's their job. That's their work. So it's employment discrimination if you're not hiring dark skin hiring dark skin producers and directors, right? Like that's employment discrimination. It's not quote unquote just entertainment, just the media. We don't need to care about that, right? So so discriminating against the darker skin actors is no different than discriminating against darker skin t bank tellers or darker skinned teachers or whatever um, other career or job arena we're talking about. Um, so I'll say really quickly too that I'm in a different location. I don't know if, you, if it's that obvious, but so excuse my internet connection. I don't think it's as good as my last internet connection, even though that wasn't perfect either. So hopefully I stay connected long enough to finish this conversation. <laughs> All right, so let me go back up and see what comments y'all have dropped. And if you're just tuning in, say hello. Let me know where you're watching from. What's the weather like where you're at? Um, so Lucid Lowe says that was very interesting to hear about her fro. I didn't know she had to put in so much work to get her hair like that. Yeah, so Lucid Lowe's comment is about Angela Davis and how she became an icon for Afro hair, for the Afro. And in her autobiography, I was surprised to know too that her hair does not naturally Afro itself. Like my, I didn't, I'm, I just washed my hair and I twisted it and untwisted it. And it's, it's, this is my hair, right? I'm not teasing it or doing anything to make it stay in the Afro shape. Um, but Angela Davis was talking about how she and her sister and like other women whose hair was not type four hair had to like tease their hair to make it stay in an Afro shape. And so I just think it's really kind of sad and an example of colorism, how she became that iconic image of the black woman with the Afro, right? Um, let's see. 
Lucid Love says, this is the only time that I can say my situation may be an exception. My education level and employment has surpassed my light-skinned sibling. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, and so that that exception, um, sometimes Lucid Los, um, because darker-skinned people know our sense or have an intuition about what we're up against, sometimes we strive for greater achievement, right? And I did a... Um, I did a live on internalized colorism and how sometimes that can manifest as darker skinned people were saying for this was me, my situation. I felt like I had to be smarter. I felt like I had to be the smart one. Like that was the thing I could hang my hat on because as a dark skinned person, people weren't going to, you know, let me in the room because of how I looked. So I had my skills had to be on point, right? Like my knowledge had to be on point. My um, ability to deliver had to be on point. And so I think sometimes darker skinned people are driven, are highly motivated to accomplish things for that reason. Um, Black Knight 06, 26.2, major news anchors and politicians are overwhelmingly light skinned. That, that's a good one too. Yeah, um, that's why um, Joy Reid is somebody that my family like loves to watch and support because it's, it's sad that um, it's so meaningful her representation on national news networks is so meaningful to us because it's so rare like we know that like oh my gosh like i don't remember you know seeing someone who looks like joy reed you know being i don't know is she on msnbc i think she's on msnbc um being like in a national chair in a national position in that way um and then there's still the, the hair issue, right? Like, so even if you are um, given a spot on national TV, it's so, so rare to see a news anchor wear their natural hair, right? A black woman as a news anchor of any shade, to be honest, like is gonna probably be wearing straight hair. It's so rare to see someone where they wear natural, especially type four hair, um, as a journalist or an anchor or a TV personality. Um, thank you, Sarah Bestwill, for the badge. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. Um, Deep House Nation, rap music's fixation on exotic cars, foreign clothes, so you can't tell me they aren't subconsciously promoting other light-skinned foreign women. Interesting. Okay, um, Deep House Nation, that's a deep thought right there. <laughs> Um, how, yeah, that's in the rap industry, the music industry, there is, um, a fetish, fetishization of the exotic looking woman. Um, it's interesting though, because exotic, um, changes depending on who is per doing the perceiving, right? So somebody might perceive me as exotic, right? Versus, you know, somebody who looks like, um... I don't know, ambiguously raced. Um, yeah, so for black rap artists though, because they grew up around people who are unambiguously black, they see the light-skinned, foreign, white, Eastern European, Western European woman, um, even sometimes Middle Eastern women as being like exotic, right? Um, but it's still not, um, it's still not, cute to be fetishized, right? And the exotic um, label. There was a question someone posed to me about that label of being considered exotic and how it's a type of dehumanization. And so while they're putting those women up on a pedestal in a way, they're still um, objectifying those women. Um, all right, Lucid Los, thank you for the badge. Oh my gosh, baby girl bridge. Thank y'all so much. I love y'all. Okay, Ken Ken, check out Tashara Parker. She's darker skin and wears her natural type four hair. News anchor, really nice, excellent, Tashara Parker. Okay, so let's make note of that. <laughs> um, do you know what network she's on? Like where, where, could, where do we watch her on? Um, Deep House Nation says a dark skin woman with Cardi B's resume wouldn't have gotten half as far as she did. Oh, 100%, 100%. Yeah, and the it's, it's that way across the board. That's Cardi B, Nicki Minaj, Alicia Keys, Beyonce, um, 
Georgia Smith, uh, Ella May, Ella Mai, like all the light skinned entertainers and actresses as well. Um, if they were darker skinned with the same exact resume, they would not have, you know, reached the level of prominence that they did. And so it doesn't mean I always have to say because, you know, people want to accuse me of hating. I'm not saying those women aren't talented. I'm not saying I, I listen to a lot of that music. Right. Um, but a dark skinned woman with the same level of talent, talent, the same level of experience and sometimes even more talent and more experience doesn't get the recognition and the opportunities and the doors open for them the way that light skinned people do. Yeah, so Black Night 06 is um, kind of confirming that, you know, who's ex who's considered exotic depends on where you are and where you're coming from. Right. So um, he says that exotic is dependent upon location in Germany. Dark skin, dark black skin is exotic. Yeah. Um, but again, I think that keeping that in mind, like it's not um, it's a tw it's a sort of a twisted way of pedestaling people that is ultimately a form of objectification. Right. It, it emphasizes the way that you are alien or foreign or extraterrestrial. Right. So they're just being human and being beautiful as a human. Um, Lucid Lowe says Cardi B's color and ethnicity have opened doors for her, especially in the black entertainment sector. Yeah. So it's important to know that Cardi B is I'm a, I don't y'all know. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't follow um, Cardi B's career like that. Um, but being um, ethnically Lat Latinx, right, like that. And speaking of exoticism, right, in the black entertainment industry, she's that much more exotic, not just because she is lighter skinned, but she can claim that Latina dad, that Latinx identity too. And, and African Americans, for some reason, unfortunately, I think it's our internalized anti blackness. We like people just melt if you say you're Afro Latina. And also let's acknowledge that not all Afro Latinx people are light skinned. There are people who are Afro Latino who look like me, right? And so that's another like misconception that to be Afro Latina means to look um, biracial or to have like this ambiguous look and have like loose curls and, you know, light skin. And that's just not the case. Um, but yeah. And I don't know, I remember Cardi B having some conversations related to colorism in the beginning that I I can't remember if I, what I thought about them because it's been so long, but... Okay, so I want to move forward to the next question that I was next topic, and that is how color has been a form of generational wealth. Um, so in a presentation I did, I, I used um, Kamala Harris as a case study of, you know, colorism and how that gives people opportunities and access. And someone pushed back um, at me by saying that she was the only woman of color running for president. And so how could it be colorism, right? So aside from the fact that she was selected for vice president from a pool of other women that included dark skinned women, aside from that, right, which could be looked at through the lens of colorism, colorism is not just about like that one moment, right? So colorism is not just like, oh, I got this job because I worked for it. Colorism is about the totality of your life and how everything that happened in your life from birth until the present puts you in the position to even apply for that job, right? It puts you in a position to even be, to gain the qualifications for that job. It puts you in the position to know someone who knew someone who could give you that job, right? And so you can't just say, oh, that, that one moment in time was not colorism because colorism is also about how you've benefited from light skin privilege and how that has compounded throughout your life. But generational privilege is also a thing when it comes to colorism. So if you had very light-skinned grandparents, you're more likely to be in a better socioeconomic place because of the privileges that your grandparents had. So you start off at a higher level socioeconomically than people who had darker-skinned grandparents who were not... Um, admitted to certain universities because they were darker skin, who were turned away from certain jobs because they were darker skin. And this has, so the practice of employment discrimination 
allowed lighter skinned people to get a job and therefore build wealth, to build their economic stability that their children and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren have all benefited from. Right. So you can't just look at your individual life as a light skinned person and say, but I worked for everything I got. No, you didn't. You didn't work for everything you have. <laughs> and this is true for everybody, right? Like I'm focusing on skin tone here, but this is true for everybody. Everything I have as a dark skinned person, I didn't work for. Right. Because my mom went to college, which then put me in a different place than someone whose parents, whose first generation college student. Right. And so certainly for our light skin relatives and family members, and I mean like the global collective of family and relatives, um, you didn't work for everything you got because the privilege that your grand great grandparents and your grandparents and your parents had, you are benefiting from that as well. And so if you have several generations of light skin people, that is several generations of light skin privilege that you're building off from, that you're starting from, right? And I think that's something important to keep in mind. And this began in the U.S., in the U.S. context, talking about African-Americans. This started with the institution of slavery in the U.S., right? And so the, the children, the offspring of um, white male slaveholders were more likely to get a formal education. They were more likely to be sent to boarding schools and to be trained in skills that they could then use to gain economic stability. And they were more likely to be granted their freedom, right? They were more likely to inherit um, certain types of property or assets, right, or money. Um, and I'm not saying that this was like a common everyday thing, right? This, this didn't happen for all mixed race people who were enslaved, but it, it was far, far more likely to happen if you were a lighter skinned slave, especially if you were a mixed race enslaved person um, versus, you know, African people who were enslaved or black dark skinned people who were enslaved. And then you can only imagine that if you were freed, given your freedom and also had a skill and was taught to read and write, how then you could establish um, a life for yourself that your descendants would be in a better position right, going forward. And so that's what we mean when we talk about generational privilege and generational wealth. And I also want to acknowledge that those, especially like in a place like Louisiana, for example, it's, it's so common to see entire families, like multi-generational families that are all light-skinned, like all really light-skinned that have like straighter hair. And so like four generations of people like in a family photo and they're all the same color. They're all the same beige color. And so there's, it's really rare to see a family like that, that doesn't have economic privilege resulting from color privilege, right? Um, and to be honest, to be quite frank, like those families, right, got together with other families like that and they would create, um, like a separate class of black people, especially like during um, the institution of slavery and shortly after during reconstruction and that sort of thing, you had these classes, these social classes of um, people with mixed ancestry um, that established themselves as a separate class from black Negroes, from darker skin. They, they use terms like darky, right? Like offensive terms like that. But they segregated themselves as a different kind of people, a different type of, of person or class. Um, and they built institutions, they built neighborhoods and communities and schools and organizations and networks, um, careers, right? Um, businesses that they reserved for themselves, that they reserved for other people like them and excluded dark-skinned Black people, excluded Black people who did not have mixed ancestry, excluded um, dark-skinned people who uh, even had um, the education and the, the money to afford, you know, the, to enter those spaces. Um, yeah, so even, you know, if you feel like you've worked for everything you've gotten and you worked hard as a light-skinned person, part of your privilege is not just what you're experiencing in your day-to-day -day life, even though that's very real. You just have to little shift your lens a little bit to recognize it. But your privilege as a lighter-skinned person is also from the fact 
um, especially if you are from a family like that, a family that has multiple generations of white skin privilege. Like it's, it's just not even close. It doesn't even come close um, to starting off in the same socioeconomic class or social class as darker skinned people who have um, not had those generational opportunities. All right, so I have one more and then I'm gonna read some questions before I get to that. Let's see, where did I leave off in terms of questions? Um, I'm so glad you pointed out that African-Americans fetishize Latinos, especially the light-skinned ones. I've always found it to be so strange because Latinx culture is inherently anti-black and anti-dark skin. Yeah, colorism is super, super rampant. Anti-blackness is super, super rampant in Latinx communities, period, full stop. <laughs> Um, Deep House Nation says exactly. I've seen a monkey ride a tricycle. That doesn't mean it's normal for all of them. <laughs> That's a very, very poignant example. Um, Black Knight 06, 26.2 says HBCUs that opened immediately after the Civil War had mostly light skinned students that could read, write, and do math. Yep. Yep. Um, it's terrifying to hear lighter skinned people use the exact same talking points white people use when denying racism. Yeah, it's for me, I don't feel like it's terrifying. I just feel like it's enraging. <laughs> it's frustrating to say the least. And it makes me outright mad um, when they do the same mental gym gymnastics to deny their privilege that white people use to deny their privilege. Right. I just, I just don't know how they don't see it. <laughs> um, Carrie o Career 05, this is so true. You see this in the Caribbean too. Um, Ken, Ken, I have Creole family that are racially ambiguous. They intentionally maintained lighter skin to pres preserve purity. Yes, absolutely. It, it was a big deal. Like, don't you bring home no quote unquote darky. Like, we not trying to have grandchildren that are dark skinned like you better marry somebody your color are lighter right um and haiti has had that bad no angry passengers welcome back i remember that screen name because it's a really fun screen name i was told that there's a strict social code in louisiana about marrying people of the same color it still exists mm -hmm. oh yeah <laughs> louisiana folks don't be mad at me um, Lucid Lowe says Deep House Nation agreed I'm Haitian American and I can tell you it is bad in the Haitian community. Black Knight 06, Jack and Jill, an elite black groups for children. Yeah, so they built social networks to advance their own cause but excluded dark skinned people from benefiting from those extended social networks. Um, Career 05 says a lot of it was linked to ownership of land, property, and access to private education. Yep. That's, see, y'all, my, somebody left me a DM and they were like, you have great followers. And I was like, yes, indeed. Like, the people who follow me on Instagram are like, whew, I love y'all. I'm like fangirling. Just love it. Y'all drop so much knowledge. <laughs> also rampant in Indian communities. Yeah, um, agreed. Uh, it's a spectrum of privilege. 60 Minutes did a story on two churches in Louisiana, one of dark skinned black and one for light skinned black. I think I remember that. I think I remember that special. Yeah, and that was like from the area of Louisiana that my mom grew up in too. And that was one of, that's, I, don't, I think my mom was watching. Um, hey, smart girl Simone, welcome. My mom always said she never saw herself as light skinned because she grew up in an area of Louisiana where there were black people who looked white. So there were like black people with like straight red hair and green eyes and freckles. Um, and so she, you know, never, she's always said like, that's what she thought light skinned was. And so she always saw herself as brown, right? And um, it's been, it's been an interesting conversation over the years to tell my mom, like, I understand where you're coming from. I really do. But in the grand scheme of things, you're light skinned. <laughs> there she is. She says, I'm watching. <laughs> hey, Sarah from the Mixed Bloom Room. <laughs> All right. I love y'all so, so much. Y'all are so smart and brilliant. And you inspire me every day. Like everyone who watches my lives or watches the recording or leaves a comment or likes my posts. I love this work. I really do. <laughs> okay. All right. So the last question that I have in my notes, 
um, is that if color is currency, what can it afford you? Um, so I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so I propose that color as currency can afford you anything that money can afford you and a lot of things that money can't afford you. So in, in my perspective, color is has a certain type of value afford you right so it afford you the same stuff that money does and then some i don't know right <laughs> so here's what i'm gonna say one when i talked about like employment discrimination right so we've already established that having lighter skins can be your ticket to getting money in the first place that's just how society is currently structured Society is structured in a way that having a lighter skin tone and more European Eurocentric features can allow you to earn money in the first place, right? Makes it easier, puts less hurdles in your way to earn that money. Um, but then I also notice a lot that when light skinned people don't have money and they don't come from privileged families, they are more likely to receive scholarships and sponsorships and donations and be um, have things allocated to them or resources distributed to them right and this this is like even as simple as because people that subconscious bias about lighter skin being innocent about it being um like beautiful and the halo effect right people are more likely to do nice things for you people are more likely to say oh um, I empathize with you so much. Let me help you. Here, let me help you do this because you're more approachable and you're more relatable. And so I'm going to open up this door for you even though you couldn't pay to get in. And that's a reality, folks. That's a reality. <laughs> now, I'm dark-skinned. People have done nice things for me. People have donated clothes to me. People have, you know, just done nice things for me, given me, like, summer jobs and things like that. Um, but those people were not colorists. There are colorist people in society, just like there are racist people in society who would have maybe given my sister a summer job because she's lighter, right? And not wanted to work with me. Um, and so, yeah, people, even if as a light-skinned person, even if you can't pay to enter a door, people are more likely to open the door for you or in favor of you and support of you, right? And so you garner, you garner more sympathy. You garner more empathy as a lighter skinned person. And then that gives you space. That gives you extra time. People are more likely to want to be your mentor. Like, oh, you're so special. Let's, you know, I'm going to spend my time and resources mentoring you and helping build you up in a certain way. Um, yes, not yesterday, last week on the last live, um, we started talking about the marriage market and how in a heteronormative marriage market, light-skinned women are have a lot of currency, have the most currency in terms of um, dating and marriage in a heteronormative context, um, which, you know, historically made an even bigger difference because of the limitations based on gender. Um, but in all societies, right? We, I talked about Indian matrimonials and you know matchmaking practices in Southeast Asia and in the United States where it's less explicit, but it still exists, how um, lighter skinned women are the first to get married. They, are, they get married earlier and sooner. Um, and also they're more likely to marry a spouse, a husband who earns more money, right? Who's of the same or higher socioeconomic status. And that only matters because that lighter skinned woman is able to acquire greater financial stability. She's able to have greater economic progress due to that union, right? And that's really, I'm not an expert on the institution of marriage, but that's why it started in the first place. Let's be honest. like marriage was created as a practice, as a social institution to, for people to combine assets, to combine resources, to combine power, right? Um, and then, you know, research studies have shown that darker skinned women are the last to get married. Um, and then they are less likely to marry a husband of 
a higher socioeconomic status than them. They're actually more likely to marry a husband who has a lower socioeconomic status than they do, right? And not that that matters in terms of the value of that man, right? Like he's not less than because he doesn't earn as much money. But what I'm using this as an example of is that it takes longer for darker skinned women to build wealth because their partner is of a lower socioeconomic status, right? And so lighter skinned women and their children are achieve financial stability quicker because of the institution of marriage as it's currently set up in today's society. And we can, we can tell ourselves that it's different, that maybe that was a, a time in the past when it was like that, but it still plays out that way even in modern times, like even in modern societies where we're not explicitly, you know, marrying off our daughters based on how much money and yada, yada, yada. It's still like um, an underlying element to the institution of marriage. And it is an institution. So we'll, that's another conversation. <laughs> but it's very much an institutional practice that people have been able to use to increase their economic um, progress. Um, but then also color as currency now I'll end here before I read the last few comments that you all have. So my last prepared comment is that color as currency also affords you emotional and psychological um, comfort and affirmation, right? The things that you don't have to deal with as a result of your light skin privilege is priceless. The, the stress, the microaggressions, the lack of representation, Right, like those intangible emotional and psychological benefits to being well affirmed in society, to being very visible in society, to having people who look like you um, well represented throughout society, like that kind of psychological and emotional benefit and gain is priceless. And so, in that sense, um, even money doesn't really afford people that necessarily um, because you could have. Uh, all the money in the world as a darker skinned person and still not be able to buy um, your way out of stereotypes, still not be able to buy adequate representation of yourself. Um, so that, that kind of like less stressful lifestyle <laughs> that comes with not having to deal with the, the way that darker skin is devalued and degraded very much so in society. All right, so that, those are my prepared talking points. Um, and so, but I saw many more comments coming through, so I'll read those before we close out for today. This is just a reminder that on Friday, August 20th at noon, we're doing a live book launch. So the contest is an international contest, right? So if you're watching from another country outside of the United States, remember that the U.S. has four different time zones, right? Because I've, I've done work with people like in the U.K. and Germany, um, and they all default to New York City <laughs> as a time zone for the U.S. But central time is Chicago. So if you want to Google or look up, you know, what time is it in Chicago, that'll tell you when to tune in for the live book launch for my folks who are not in the United States. And for those who are in the United States, you know what central time means already. Um, so noon central time on the Colorism Healing YouTube channel. So if you just navigate to the YouTube channel. The link is in my Instagram bio as well. Um, but on that channel, the day of the live, it'll be the first video that you see. You just click on it and watch. Um, you'll see many of the writers and they'll be reading and talking about colorism, healing from it, um, what we can do as a co global community to address it. Um, and then there'll be some fun interactive things for the audience as well. I'll be asking you all questions and if you respond, you can win some swag possibly a free copy of the book, as well as like, you know, stickers and t-shirt and things like that. Um, all right, so let's see what other final comments you all have dropped. Um, oh, Sarah Bestwell says, hi, mom. <laughs> all right, yeah, smart girl, Simone. The Hispanic and Latino community has a lot of colorism too. That is so, it's, it's very, it's more explicit <laughs> In, in Latinx communities sometimes, even in, in the African-American community. Um, skin color can determine how a person gets treated by the police. 100%, yeah. And so when we talk about skin color as currency, it's like being able to pay your way out of a ticket or being able to like pay a fine out of a court date, right? Like it is um, 
being able to pay to have good legal counsel even, right? Without actually paying to have good legal counsel. And actually, as I'm saying, as I'm thinking that, that is, that is true. Like having lighter skin um, is almost like paying for better legal counsel. If we look at the research that shows that having lighter skin results in um, more favorable outcomes for you in the justice system, right? You are less likely to be harassed, profiled, shot, killed by the police. You are less likely to serve um, lengthy or uh, oppressive jail sentences or like unnecessarily harsh jail sentencing and that kind of thing. So it is like you can pay to have a really good lawyer help you negotiate a better um, outcome or sentencing or help you get off altogether. Or you can benefit from implicit bias that um, suggests you're more likely to be innocent or that rationalizes your actions because you're lighter skinned. Um, K-Drama Oma says, Dr. Webb's mom is in the house. Your daughter is amazing. Ha ha, you hear, you hear that, Ma? <laughs> I'm going to use that as leverage one day. <laughs> I'm like, but, you know. <laughs> Lucy Lowe says, do you feel like ethnicity plays a role in employment discrimination? I've noticed corporate America is more willing to hire a dark-skinned Nigerian than a dark-skinned African-American. Lucy Lowe's. Let's dig into this. This might deserve its own live stream for sure. Um, but yes, absolutely, ethnicity plays a huge factor in employment discrimination, but also discrimination in general. When we look at adoptions, right? And how um, a lot of white families who adopt black children are adopting um, black children from other countries outside of the United States, right? And so there is this... Um, in white culture there's this sort of i don't i don't know the precise words to use but there's this white saviorism is is one of the words but also they almost infantilize right like black people from other countries right it's almost like they are innocent and they just need our they just need help from white people whereas african americans are just criminal and just bad right it's a, it's a weird thing that is not often enough talked about, about how it's not just anti-Blackness, but it's also anti-African-Americanness <laughs> and how even like um, internationally, like African-Americans as a distinct group from other Black people on the continent or in the diaspora, African-Americans specifically are seen as like the the problem child of black people like we are the more stigmatized ethnic group amongst black people like people really just don't like african americans even if they like black people from other places it's it's strange and it's interesting and a lot of it has to do with um the media the international media and so people who have never interacted with african americans themselves like in person um outside of the media um, you look at the media from the United States that is shipped and distributed overseas and all these other countries. And so what are people's, um, what are people being fed in terms of the images and the narratives they have about African Americans? And it's all negative, right? Um, so yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there, there's a lot, whole conversation about that. Um, JB1710 says, hey y'all, y'all are the best, powerful. <laughs> this is a little good question that does explain um, explores often. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, a lot of white men in corporate America think I am Ethiopian or Somali. And I wonder if they knew that I wasn't, would they still hire me? Futurism is also a thing in corporate America. Yeah, I think that's very perceptive, very insightful. Um, I'm, <laughs> yeah. Let me know if you ever want to come on live. I don't know. I think I've asked you that before. I, it might have been you or someone else, but I was like, you got to come on live and just like talk to the people. Um, Smart Girl Simone says, it is sad that some people want to get with other people of a certain skin color just for their babies to look a certain way. Oh, 100 percent. One of the first poems in the International Writing Contest was about was called The Baby Factory by Cassandra Alford. Cassandra Alford. Um, and this was like 2014, y'all. So I remember, I remember when y'all submit to the writing contest and y'all pieces up be dope. 
I remember your names and I remember, you know, what you wrote. But she talked about the baby factory and how she that was the name of her poem and how people selected their mates or their partners based on what they hoped their children would look like. Very much a practice. And in um, a lot of Latin, Latin American countries, for example, is called um, whitening the race or bettering the race. Mejorando la raza or blanqueamiento la raza. So purposely marry a lighter skinned person or a white person so that your children, your descendants have lighter skin and more European features. Um, Career 05 says my elderly mother is lighter skinned woman from the Caribbean. People are deferential to her and treat her differently to other dark skinned elderly people. It never changes even as you get older. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation to make um, and to know that it persists throughout your lifetime. And again, when I talk about compounding, like privilege compounds, just like you can have a savings account with interest. And so it grows, it accrues over time, like that privilege. And but your oppression can also account, compound over time. Right. And so it's, it's definitely not just about one isolated moment as colorism, but like your whole life, like that privilege has been a compounding for you over time. Chicago in the house. All right. <laughs> okay, so I think um I've gotten to all the comments and questions. Um, Career Five says yes. Black British actors are seen as better, classically trained. Yeah, and Laren Alta, um, who I did a podcast with, we were having a conversation about that. How a lot of the Black British actors, um, who are darker skinned, a lot of the dark skinned actors are not African American. So that's a conversation, y'all. We gotta have. When we think about um, the guy who played in Get Out, when we think about the, the lady from Queen and Slim, right? Like even the the, the actors in Queen and Slim, like beautiful dark skinned people. Um, but it's almost like them being British um, made them more palatable as dark skinned people. Um, yeah, it's really interesting dynamic. Um, Lucid Lowe says, yes, you asked me. I work from home, so I'm kind of sneaking to tune. Oh, yeah, okay, that, I do remember you saying that, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, outlier, I've had light-skinned women say they only date dark-skinned men. Yeah, Black Night 06, so that could be a whole other live stream, too, is the fetishization of dark-skinned men by light-skinned women. But I always used to say, too, and I'll, I'll close for real, y'all. I used to always say, too, when I would hear light-skinned women say, well, I just, I just love dark-skinned men. Like, they, they would say that to try to prove that they were not color-struck. And I'm like, but that actually proves that you are color-struck. One, um, it is a form of fetishization. But two, light-skinned women know that they have the power to choose. Hmm? Hmm? Light-skinned women know that they have the power to be exclusive because they are um, more, they have greater status and greater clout in the dating market, right? So it's it's fashionable and easy for them to say, well, I'm, I'm narrowing my dating pool to only this type of men because I can literally afford to do that. Because again, color is currency. <laughs> and on that note, Thank y'all. I was feeling, I started feeling like nervous before I got on this live stream. So I'm glad it went well. I think it went well. Um, y'all make it great every time. Um, so I look forward to next week. I don't know what I'm going to talk about next week, but I'll figure it out. Maybe I'll piggyback on some of the subtopics that came up in our conversation today. But until then, I'll catch y'all um, somewhere online. Um, and Friday. Yes. Yeah, so before next week, Hopefully, I'll see you in the chat on the live stream on YouTube on Friday at noon central time. All right. Love y'all. Take care. <laughs>